it's my pleasure to introduce Menno Feldhorst from uh, Delft. Uh, Menno and I were colleagues uh, at UNSW with, along with um, some of the people that are, that are um, watching this, <laughs> this video. Um, and then again um, at, at Delft for, for a few years. And um, when I saw this, uh, the, the paper that he, the, the, the work that he's gonna um, talk about, when I saw it come out in archive, I, I actually got really excited because um, I've been following these, these germanium um, qubits um, and and I think the yeah you've made like really awesome and quick progress on them, so um, yeah uh, take it away. I'm really excited to hear what what, what it's about. Yeah, thank you, uh, JP. I guess uh, uh, is it actually being recorded or not? Uh, yes. Yeah. So I guess this is uh, yeah. I should be honored to be uh, I guess for the first time being recorded at 7 a.m. Uh, in the morning. Uh, <laughs> no, but without getting it, it's it's really a um, honor and, and, and pleasure uh, to present in front of you. Uh, as you may know, I, I spent quite some time uh, in Sydney and in particular in this time of the year, I often think back of that time, uh, not only because of the uh, beautiful beaches, but also really the uh, time I think that was really, um, the, that, that really gave a boost in my career, um, being part of the groups of uh, Andrew Zurich and also I learned a lot from Andrea Morello. And I'm really uh, thankful for that. And so it's really a pleasure to present here. Um, so in the past few years, uh, my group focused on both silicon and germanium uh, qubits. And here indeed, I will be presenting mostly the germanium parts. Uh, and perhaps as a starter or maybe a take home message, I think this was in a uh, conference in Tokyo, Japan, that Daniel Loss, he asked me, um, uh, whether I shouldn't be studying uh, holes instead of electrons. And I think my response back then was that I thought that the spin orbit interaction uh, that's present for holes uh, would cause such a quick decoherence that probably one could have do very useful things with it. Um, and, and I'm hoping that um, you would agree with me that after this presentation, I was pretty wrong at that time. Uh, and it actually, uh, it's actually a very remarkable platform and I think we'll see many more results in, in, uh, with germanium in the coming years. Uh, and so indeed, so you see uh, two qubits times two, uh, we'll focus on, on mostly our work on a four qubit uh, germanium quantum processor. But to take it a bit a step back, um, I was still at high school, uh, 1998, uh, but two very uh, seminal works came out. Uh, one was proposing to use silicon uh, for quantum information, and the other one was to use quantum computation with quantum dots. And I think these two papers really inspired the field. And perhaps something that, that really stands me by is that these quantum dots, as you see in the figure on the left, they're not really circular, right? They're not perfect. And, and that was not because of their drawing skills, uh, but that was really intentional to showcase that each and every quantum dot is, is unique. And perhaps to state it a bit differently, when I, when I started uh, my postdoc at UNSW, uh, Andre Morello would tell me that it's really crucial to build up a relationship with your qubits. It would go even that far that you, you, know, you need even to hack your fridge because a qubit has a personality or a quantum dot has a personality and you need to understand that. And, and I think that that was really true at the time that quantum dots weren't uh, perfect. Uh, but I think at the same time, we've seen in the past few years some remarkable developments uh, that were going slightly away from that. And I think that's one of the big challenges in our fields. Can we make quantum dots so good uh, that quantum dot qubits don't have a personality anymore? And, and so this is something I want to uh, discuss, present also today. So to talk a bit about the developments, I think really great advancements has been made with Gallimard smart quantum dots. So here you see on the left, um, some double dot uh, uh, system in Gallimard's night uh, that really led to the first uh, works showing uh, uh, coherent coupling between uh, two quantum dots. Uh, but in the meantime, 
we can really scale up these systems to larger arrays. And here on the right, you see, for example, on Qubyte, uh, we're using virtual gates. It's, it's actually not too hard anymore to, to tune up such a device. And I'm pretty convinced that, at least in, in one dimension, what we could continue this, this game and go to even larger systems. So in terms of quantum dots, Gallium Mars tonight was, was really a good platform because it has this enormously low disorder and that's a great strength. At the same time, um, Gallium Mars Knight is a free five material and there's uh, lots of hyperfine interactions that will lead to uh, quick decoherence. And so, although uh, despite the, the developments made with quantum dots, uh, the limiting coherence warranted to search for other materials. Um, and so simply by changing materials from gallium arsenide to silicon, uh, great progress has been made in, in the quantum coherence time. Uh, and here you see that by using silicon 28 coherence times to up to even tens of milliseconds could be achieved. And if that's not good enough for you, then you see that by using phosphorus qubits in, in silicon 28, coherence times up to even to beyond half a second have been realized. So, so by, by changing materials, uh, really uh, remarkable progress has been made. At the same time, uh, silicon has also its challenges. Uh, there's, for example, valley degeneracy. Uh, also, silicon has a rather large effective mass, uh, which results in the need to design very small quantum dots. Uh, in, in silicon itself, there is disorder. Um, and so there's also challenges in that field and so silicon may not be the ultimate material in the end, at least as it stands now. Um, nonetheless, given these, this kind of um, uh, limitation, but, but building up on the progress, um, there's been thoughts on, on how uh, can we really go to larger systems? And here I showcase two of those two thoughts. One would be, well, silicon is um, compatible with advanced semiconductor manufacturing. And that enables to integrate uh, classical electronics on the same um, chip and using, for example, uh, floating gates and transistors to create a scalable quantum dot system. Um, despite its appealingness, the challenge here is, of course, that transistors need to be enormously small in order to allow their integration. On the other side of the perspective um, is the crossbar arrays where rather than using electronics, we're using shared control for operation. Um, and, and that would be possible if a certain uniformity would be needed. In particular here, in that paper, it was demanded that with uh, a single gate voltage, you can tune quantum dots to the single electron or single charge occupancy. Um, and that, of course, requires a very high uniformity. And so in the end, maybe it's, it's somewhere in between either using electronics or using the uniformity that would enable to go to larger systems. Uh, but it's clear that we both need this, this very high uniformity and this very uh, good quantum coherence uh, together to go to these larger systems. If we focus a bit more on, on scaling up, um, um, then quantum dots have actually already a uh, very exciting opportunity, and that's their ability to operate above one Kelvin. I think that's something we saw in the past year, um, where on the one side, um, single qubit and two qubit gates have been demonstrated above temperature of one Kelvin, and simultaneously, um, um, uh, CMOS uh, cryogenic control, uh, for example, microwave control, has already been demonstrated to be possible to operate at these level, total amount of temperatures. So we're slowly starting to see a drift from having all the electronics at room temperatures, qubits at mini Kelvin, to a, a regime where both may be integrated together. Perhaps to give it another twist on this needs for quantum dots. So one is the uniformity, the other one was the coherence. It's also the way uh, one operates. Um, so in, initially in, in uh, silicon, what often has been used is to use a strip line where you pass an AC electric current uh, through a metal line that generates an AC magnetic field uh, to uh, then uh, perform Rabi rotations with a, on a quantum of qubit. Um, but scaling up there poses its challenges. Uh, for example, the heat dissipation, can one have individual qubit addressability? 
and so forth. And so that's, that's really a challenge there. And so as an alternative to using strip lines, one may use a nanomagnet uh, instead. So by driving um, an, an AC tone to a quantum dot, the electron will move and the AC electric field will then in turn uh, result in an AC magnetic field once there is a magnetic field gradient. But also here, although it's, it's called a nanomagnet, in the end, uh, these magnets are not really that nano, uh, meaning that they're much bigger than, than the quantum dots themselves. Uh, and so if we would envision to scale up these devices, uh, one challenge is, is to build a two-dimensional array with the suitable field gradients using nanomagnets. And I think, as far as I, I know, this is really an open uh, challenge in the field and we would not really know how to scale to larger systems. Now, there's also a third option, and that's to use the intrinsic spin orbit uh, coupling. And so again, by applying an AC electric tone, the spin orbit coupling uh, results in an effective AC magnetic field. So this, this was initially used in free five materials, where typically the spin orbit coupling is, is a bit larger, uh, and therefore it's possible to use this effect. Uh, but typically in those devices, quantum coherence would limit to do something with it. And something what we have seen in the um, past four years is by switching to holes uh, where spin orbit coupling is typically larger, uh, one can use group four materials again. And so spin orbit driven qubits have been demonstrated in both silicon uh, and germanium. And now then, then the question then comes, okay, so gallium arsenide has this uh, very good uniformity. It has a low effective mass. Uh, silicon, on the other hand, is a group four material. It's uh, compatible with advanced semiconductor manufacturing. Um, um, and, and it uh, can be isotopically purified. Um, perhaps holes then instead can be uh, driven using the spin orbit coupling. Uh, but there's then some kind of platform that unites all these assets in one. And, and um, a few years back, um, we started to investigate whether germanium could be that platform. And it turns out that the um, silicon uh, heterostructures that we're using uh, to make uh, strained silicon quantum dot qubits can almost be uh, directly used to also uh, realize germanium heterostructures. Just by changing the compositions and so forth, one can um, define a strained germanium layer. And this is something that um, my collaborator, Giordano Scapucci, who works in Delft is really pioneered and he uh, really obtains amazing results in, in that platform to build uh, high quality germanium heterostructures. And so then the idea would be to have uh, germanium, uh, which on the one hand has a very uh, small effective mass for a hole, so that's uh, so the same as for gallium arsenide, but it's also a group four material. In addition, it may already be the case uh, that holes which have uh, a P wave wave function have already less interaction with hyperfine interaction and therefore may have already longer quantum coherence by itself. Uh, and then we may also be able to use the spin orbit coupling for the electric driving. Now maybe a last argument, and, and that's not on this graph here, and I think it has been um, underrated uh, thus far, is the ability to make omic contacts to germanium. So I won't be discussing that too much today, uh, but for example, one could make um, uh, Joseon, k tunable Joseon junctions with germanium uh, because of the omic contact. But for quantum dots, there's also a different interest, and that's that we don't need dopants anymore. So to make contact to the germanium, we can make direct contact with a metal. And I believe that this will be uh, an important asset in, for example, the design of local single electron transistors, uh, as well as optimizing a readout, for example, in, in, in terms of RF readout and so forth. So I think that's, that's something that's not on this list, but it's actually a great asset of germanium as well. Um, so these were, as you see here, one of the first few heterostructures realized by Giordano Scapucci. And what we see here that, that um, germanium uh, can have a very high mobility, can be even above a million. And by further optimizing the location of the quantum well, we can now achieve charge noise values measured in quantum dots that are below the detection limit of our setup, uh, which is below 0.2 microelectron volt per square hertz. 
In addition, the percolation density can also be extremely low, uh, kind of um, uh, demonstrating the, the high quality of the heterostructures themselves. And that's an ideal starting point to make quantum dot systems. So here you see some developments um, that we made in our group uh, using uh, three different platforms, so building on three different platforms in silicon, silicon germanium, and then strain germanium. Uh, and what's rather uh, appealing is that we can more or less use the same integration scheme for all these processes. So we can fine tune the fabrication process by itself uh, and then apply it to these three platforms and to test their individual uh, opportunities and their challenges. Um, although there's one difference, as I mentioned before, is, and that's that uh, with germanium, we don't need dopants um, and no thermal treatment in the fabrication, but just can directly contact with a metal, which you see on the right, which are these green gates, that's a metal, and that uh, directly defines our reservoir as well. So we have a very clean reservoir in that sense. Perhaps as a side note, you may wonder if once you make contact with a metal and you diffuse it in, is there additional noise or so? Uh, and so far we have not seen any evidence of that. Uh, and in fact, it seems to be a much cleaner contact than uh, a contact made with uh, a gate tuned to deck, uh, as it, uh, the metal itself is a very high density uh, reservoir by itself. And therefore doesn't that easily lead to um, uh, quantum dots in between the defined gate defined quantum dot and the reservoir itself. <clears throat> so having the ability to, to make quantum dots um, in, in germanium, we um, perhaps this was not, not the first result, but I think really to demonstrate the um, advancement of the platform is to demonstrate that we can confine and later on also operate a single whole quantum dot. So in fact, here you see a four quantum dot system uh, and in this work, we would tune two quantum dots to define one sensor, uh, which we can arbitrarily do in the system, uh, and then to measure the other quantum dots, as you see here. Um, and so we can confine the system to uh, confine uh, a single hole, and then <clears throat> we can also operate that single hole as a qubit, uh, where here initially we found uh, relaxation times of about one millisecond, um, and, and uh, coherence times of a few hundred nanoseconds um, by using uh, uh, Ramsey sequences, measuring Ramsey sequences. And then a quick question. Wh yeah. which, gate, which gate do you use to drive the qubit? Um, yeah, so we actually studied this uh, as well as to find the um, impact of the different gates. And what we find is that there's a rather weak uh, crosstalk. So if we would compare, so in this case, it's the plunger gate, that's a, the short answer. Um, but if we would compare the, the plunger gate, so the top gate versus a side gate, um, then you may expect that the effectiveness of the driving is perhaps related to the um, uh, lever arm of the respective gates. Um, and so by comparing that, we find that the ability to drive is even weaker than that. Uh, at most, it's the same, but often it's, it's more than an uh, order of magnitude smaller. And, and so that's something we don't really understand at the moment, but it seems that the, the driving is by itself seems to be even more local than what you would expect from the DC electric fields. Uh, of course, they are also not exactly the same mechanisms, and that would explain the reason why, uh, but it's something we're investigating. But so to answer, so we can drive with different gates, but typically we would drive with the plunger gate, which is on top. Um, and maybe one more piece of information. Uh, it may be that like you would expect from a side gate that you would need to drive um, uh, the quantum dot to the left and right to generate an AC magnetic field. It may be that a, a top gate is doing this as well. Uh, it's always hard to uh, yeah, directly understand how you would change the dot if you change the plunger gate. Just maybe one last one. Do, is it, do you have it, any sense of the anisotropy of the spin orbit coupling um, in, the, in the dot? Um, let's see. So the things that, that we do have, infra, have information of is, is, for example, the variations in the, the G factor, um, the variations in the driving ability um, as a function of gate voltage, for example. 
um, we don't we haven't measured in a vector method if that's what you're um, looking for. So we don't know um, the change um, by changing the magnetic field. So we're always trying to uh, optimize uh, the magnetic field such that at least once we couple quantum dots, then these uh, spin orbit field is perpendicular to the magnetic field. Um, but otherwise, we haven't investigated the uh, field dependence. I know that that um, uh, other groups like um, Alex Hamilton, for example, is investigating uh, this, also based on these spectral structures. Um, so that will probably provide more information. Um, what we see is if we change the electric field of a gate, we more or less linearly change uh, the G factor. And so this goes in a rather uniform manner. So we don't see effects like uh, there's maybe an interface jump or so, and suddenly we go in a different regime. These kind of effects, that's at least not visible in our systems. And it seems to be really dependent on the strength of the electric fields, uh, what determines um, um, our properties in the end. Okay, um, so I'll continue. Um, yeah. So now we have a single whole quantum dot we want to continue and scale up. And, and this was um, a rather kind of brute force uh, measurement where everything was done in transport. But the picture that you see here, this is a stability diagram. Uh, that to me was very, very informative of, of the quality of our quantum dot system. So you can see here that by keeping the same hall occupancy, so this is in a virtual uh, gate space, uh, we can uh, independently control the coupling between them. Of course, this is, this is still in the many hall regime. Um, uh, later on, we'll see that we can also do that in a single hall regime. Uh, but the ability to do so uh, already demonstrates the high quality of the system and, and the ability to go beyond um, single quantum dot operations. So here we have this two quantum dot system. Um, we can go beyond. So here again, we have this uh, four dot system. And, and by uh, then tuning a center such that we can measure the other side, and then we can do this in, uh, in all scenarios, we can see that we can uh, define double quantum dots uh, in every possible configuration. Um, showing that we can make a two by two uh, column of array to really demonstrate that we can also go to the one, 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 one uh, situation. Uh, we built a, a bit of more complex device as you see here, um, where on the right, you see the signal, uh, the combined signal of the two RF sensors uh, defined as S1 and S2. Uh, and then by taking uh, a two dimensional gate space, but putting on the axis, uh, the combined voltage uh, and uh, a voltage where we have different slopes for the different uh, quantum dots. Uh, in one map, we can then uh, measure um, the charge occupancy of every quantum dot uh, and observe that we can tune to the one 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 scenario. And furthermore, in this system, we, we showed that, that we see uh, charge, uh, um, charge filling uh, more or less consistent with a fog Darwin spectrum, so there's no valley states as one would expect, but also showing a kind of uniform uh, potential landscape, as well as the ability to control the tunnel coupling from, um, from turning off to, to really merging quantum dots. So the maximum we've been able to characterize was something like 40 gigahertz or so, but we can really keep on increasing the quantum dot coupling to the status where these uh, double quantum dots will just become one single quantum dot. And, and that's something that I believe that is maybe not so interesting for quantum computation by itself, but will be very exciting for quantum dot simulation as one can go from a strongly coupled merge system to having individual quantum bits. Um, and, and that's on an area I think that will be quite exciting uh, for quantum bits as well. So these were mostly um, uh, our quantum dots then to make the step to qubits. Um, you initially saw the single qubits. Here you see some uh, characterization results uh, of, of, this, uh, of, of single qubit gates. And, and you can see that already and even measured in transport, we can get gate fidelities that are above 99. Uh, we had to actually to do a lot of uh, inventions and engineering 
This was mostly done by uh, my PhD, Nico Hendricks and a post of David Franke. They really um, uh, advanced uh, the way to do transport measurements by doing all sorts of uh, locking measurements to get a finite signal and to get this clean data as you observe here. Uh, simultaneously, it's also clear that this is not the way forward, but it's, I think it's a beautiful experiment demonstrating uh, how, one, how good transport can be. Um, so in this work, we also showed that, that we can do two qubit gates, and in particular on the right, you see an experiment, and perhaps not that visible, but you can still see some coherent oscillations uh, to kind of demonstrate that we have a coherent uh, C-rod operations. Um, so with that, we can do single and two qubit operations in germanium, um, and that asks questions, can we go beyond? And that's something that we've been focusing on the um, last uh, half year or so, and that's really to go from a four uh, quantum dot system to a four qubit system. And so the results that I will be showing, I think have been obtained in something like two, perhaps three months or so, including the writing and the writing the software of the program. And, and I think perhaps the results are exciting, but I think the progress in which it's made is, is really showcasing the quality of the germanium itself, as in it's no longer um, that challenging to tune a quantum dot to a single whole occupancy, uh, and we can really make steps uh, to go beyond. So what you see here is a two by two quantum dot array, in including two additional quantum dots that are again used as sensors. Um, now we're, we're focusing on a quantum well, which has uh, a depth of 55 nanometers. Uh, we found that to be much more stable in particular. Uh, when you, once you have these heterostructures, there are multiple interfaces. So there's the interface with the dielectric and the SIGI, and then there's the interface with the SIGI and the germanium. And these multiple interfaces can lead to uh, things like hysteresis, drifts, and so forth, because you may start to populate at some moment the top interface as well. Um, and that can also lead to crosstalk. And by moving the position of that interface, we can increase the distance and reduce the tunneling between those um, interfaces, as well as reduce the coupling of the um, germanium layer to the uh, metal gates. And that leads to a much more quiet and stable uh, system. A 55 nanometer is, is kind of the optimum where what we uh, achieved in terms of uh, percolation density and, and mobility. And so that's why we're using this depth at the moment. Um, so in, in figure labeled C, you see again the same um, stability diagram as we showed for the four dot system, but here really not using uh, virtual gates, but directly um, just stating, let's use a gate voltage uh, uh, with certain prop proportionality constants, uh, positive and negative, and one of 0.75 and the other minus 0.75. Uh, and then we would expect to see transitions at those slopes. And more or less, uh, in, in, in quite good agreement, uh, that's also what we observe. Uh, you may see, well, there seems to be a, a, a symmetry uh, across the, the vertical axis of the zero. Uh, that's just because of the tuning axis and the way the system loads. Uh, but otherwise, we can really um, see back these, these slopes and just almost instantaneously tune the system to the 1111. Uh, location. Um, so in this system, uh, still we are using uh, just a standard magnet. We don't have a vector magnet. So we're kind of guessing our optimal field, uh, trying to do our best. And so this, it may be that the, the results that you see are not in the ideal location, uh, but it's just uh, the best that, let's say, one could guess with an eye. Um, and so uh, on the figure A, you see the direction of the magnetic fields that, that we've been using. And these results uh, that you see uh, are taken at a magnetic field of one Tesla. Now, if there is some finite angle between the spin orbit field and the magnetic field, um, that will lead to a very fast uh, spin relaxation at the 1102 anti-crossing. Uh, this was already a long time ago predicted by Yuli Nazarov. And so that challenges um, uh, readout, in particular if you would do it completely, so this orthogonal. Um, but, but also uh, if there's already a small angle. And so what we find is that the spin relaxation is very fast and it's hard to do poly spin brigade readout by itself. 
uh, in germanium. Uh, but here we have uh, connected each quantum dot to an additional omic. Uh, and by making use of those omics, we can do latch readout, uh, as, as was already demonstrated by uh, the work of Harvey, Harvey Pollard at all uh, in silicon. And so by making use of this reservoir transition, it is a slightly different um, um, configuration as in that work. Uh, we can get a, a, a block state and, and a um, 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 state that, that we go to the OTEM two state directly, depending on, on the state of the spin, as you see on pigment D. And so that latch readout, although the poly spin rotate decay is rather fast, um, we don't have to spend a long time there because it's just a matter of pulsing through it. And once it's locked, we can um, keep it into a locked state of arbitrary long time scales. And so we make use of that of the readout and then we can make uh, qubit pairs uh, for the readout itself. And so then after doing that, we can apply electric tones. And here you see the Rabi rotations of the four uh, possible uh, qubits. Um, and, and although you see some decay, you can see that, that they're quite coherent and we see some decent amount of uh, Rabi rotations in that system. So to characterize a bit further, um, we've been investigating a single qubit randomized benchmarking. I must say that this, this is not um, uh, having all the optimization there that's possible. So I can uh, certainly foresee that, that we can attain higher fidelities, but I think already we're seeing here that the single qubit gates um, are not really the, the limiting factor at the moment uh, anymore. And, and all fidelities are quite beyond uh, 99%. And one of the reasons why it's so high is because our single qubit gates can be fast in the order of five nanoseconds. Uh, and still further optimization may be possible. So maybe the field angle is something to optimize uh, shape pulses. Uh, in the end, I want to maybe be going to purify germanium, although we don't see very evidence that we're limited by hyperfine interaction. And perhaps more the result is in terms of heterostructure engineering to tune all these spin orbit fields and interactions uh, as, as one would desire. But nonetheless, I think these, these results that we're currently obtaining are quite encouraging by itself. Um, so to focus on the individual uh, T1 times, uh, you see that, that these are rather high. For qubit one, it's probably still some, some finite coupling to the reservoir in the system, uh, but it's already much longer than the um, uh, quantum coherence times. And, and so um, that's not, uh, we didn't pay too much attention to increase that further, but I, I su suspect that by, um, um, reducing the, the coupling to the reservoir where we can further increase these time scales. Uh, and therefore they're quite comparable to what we've obtained before uh, of the maximum T1 of 32 milliseconds. Uh, but also I think there there's probably room for further improvement. Then to focus on the uh, quantum coherence. Um, so we see quantum coherence on the order of a few hundred nanoseconds to something like a microseconds. Um, in the meantime, what we obtained, if we go to lower magnetic fields, we can push it to even uh, beyond one and a half microseconds. Um, and so that's rather encouraging. But perhaps, perhaps more impressive is once we do, uh, start to do CPMG. So we can truly apply lots of pulses because we can operate very fast uh, and we can get quantum coherence up to uh, 100 microseconds. And I think that's, that's a very encouraging result given uh, the gate times that, that uh, can be both for the single two qubit gates uh, relatively fast and much shorter than this time scale as you see here. Um, another way of looking at it would be to compare our results to the different Germanian implement, uh, implementations here. Uh, and bear in mind that what you see here is a log scale both for the coherence time and for the fidelities. And, and I believe that planar Germanium really is starting to stand out compared to these other platforms and, and that the ability to define quantum models in 2D structure uh, is not only promising for to scale up, uh, but also leads to a very clean interface and therefore these very uh, encour encouraging uh, results. So to continue our characterization of the four qubit system, um, here you see two qubit logic, which we initially just, just uh, tuned by measuring the C rod, which is perhaps the more uh, native way of um, investigating, perhaps not the most ideal for quantum information itself, uh, but one can directly measure, for example, the resonance energies 
uh, and the ability to coherently drive. And what you see here are combinations of single and two qubit gates, uh, where the second one is the two qubit gates. And we see that in every possible configuration of the two by two array, we can uh, obtain uh, zero operations. Uh, and I'm now measuring with both sensors. We see that the one the sensor, we either measure nothing or only measure the single qubits um, operation, depending on the configuration. Whereas in the other case, then we'll see the evolution of the CROT. Nicely demonstrating that we have a two qubit logic between all possible pairs. Now we can take this a step further and, and um, to investigate if we can further split the resonance frequencies so if we have finite exchange, then we get uh, a spitting in a resonance, which allows us in the first place to do the CROT. But if we turn on multiple um, um, uh, couplings simultaneously, we would expect that the spitting uh, spits further. Um, if you have two interactions on, for example, then one should in principle be able, be able to directly uh, implement an hyperfoly gate uh, in this uh, system. And so uh, this is something we've been investigating. And, and what I want to highlight here is that results that you see uh, are truly obtained in a dynamical manner. So it's not that we tune the quantum dot system to being decoupled to being coupled. Now we just apply an AC pulse and then um, apply the operations that we desire. Um, and so that really shows that we have good barrier control in our system um, and can just using a, a simple AC tone, either uncouple or couple uh, the system at will. And so here you see the results um, where initially we uh, form single qubit gates uh, because there's no interaction on. And so in figure C, you see that all resonances uh, overlap with themselves um, and, and uh, allowing to do a single qubit gate. And so it's not depending on the other qubit states. Now, if we turn on one interaction, either horizontally or vertically, uh, then we will see a splitting in two. If we do this again, then we'll see uh, four resonance frequencies. Um, finally, what we can do is to increase, uh, uh, to turn on all the possible interactions, and then you see an even further splitting. Um, so first from G to I, you see that we can realize uh, these itofoli gates in every possible configuration. Uh, but having all the interactions on, you see that we have again a splitting, and here the splitting uh, is in uh, uh, in eight. And in figure uh, K and, uh, L, you see that we can coherently drive these, these transitions. Um, to, to to state a bit more, uh, in figure J, for example, uh, one should realize that we can tune these interactions at will, and so here we have intentionally driven the interaction such uh, that they're nicely spaced uh, apart. So it's not that the um, uh, interaction through uh, another qubit system is per se uh, as large as the direct neighbor neighboring coupling. I know it's only that large because we can individually control these interactions uh, to tune them uh, to the locations we want. And to kind of highlight uh, that these resonance are uh, resonant, here you see the possibility to drive uh, all the individual uh, possible turning configurations. <coughs> now, they are coherent. Um, at the same time, they may remind you of the days of uh, uh, the free five uh, kind of quantum coherent experiments, although this is in a multi qubit system. Um, but it clearly shows that there is an ability to do so, uh, but perhaps it's not the most clever way if one wants to do a multi qubit uh, operations. Uh, despite that, I believe that this is again something which is very promising for quantum simulation. As now you can imagine that you can tune quantum dots at will, and if you want to do, for example, some Fermi Hubbard simulation or so, one can prepare a system, uh, turn on the interaction as one wants, um, perhaps even merge to a single quantum dot, quench the system, and then measure the evolution of the coherence throughout. So I think that's very exciting for quantum coherence, perhaps a bit less for quantum computation. And so instead of using the C-ROT, we've been investigating different ways of uh, implementing two qubit gates. And one that's, that's uh, uh, the most natural way to advance is to go from C-ROT to C-phase. So the C-phase operation is intrinsically faster than the C-ROT. And that's because it, it can make direct use of the exchange interactions itself. 
Uh, in addition uh, of that, one doesn't need to drive the system, uh, which typically um, um, reduces the amount of decoherence, as driving the system may also activate traps and uh, additional noise. Um, so here we've changed the interaction such that the CZ operations uh, can be executed uh, within 10 nanoseconds. Uh, this is something which is just convenient given the specs of our AWG. It's not a limitation in terms of speed. Um, and here you see that we can um, obtain C phase operations uh, for every possible configuration. And what's rather nice in the system is that we can now implement dynamical decoupling. And in particular, it's not only dynamical decoupling of the single qubit space, but also the multi qubit uh, space. And so we see that if we uh, implement dynamical decoupling, and in particular, once we then turn off the interaction, we can have uh, quantum coherence uh, beyond two microseconds uh, just by implementing a single qubit pulse. Uh, and that, that's, of course, very advantageous when going to larger quantum algorithms, as now we should start to compare the single qubit gates, which take about five nanoseconds, two qubit gates, which take about 10 nanoseconds, and compare that to the uh, quantum coherence of, of about two microseconds. Uh, so there's really a room uh, to do some um, quantum operations. And here you see a first kind of uh, demonstration of that. Uh, where we're we going through a GZ state. So we're starting to uh, do CZ gates, uh, then uh, convert that into C0 operations, then tangle uh, the different uh, qubit uh, pairs. Uh, and then by imp implementing uh, additional pipes in the middle, we can include uh, dynamical decoupling. And what we observe here is that we can throughout this, uh, go throughout this sequence. Um, as one would expect for once you generate the GZ state. And so the configuration for this year, the readout uh, is, is dependent on, on the way you read out. And because we read out in pairs, uh, in the middle, once we prepare those states, we don't observe states anymore because we're oscillating uh, uh, between these two uh, configurations that are uh, in the readout. But so the ability to, to um, also decouple the GIZ state, I think, really demonstrates the coherence uh, of our system. And, and through, uh, in the end, you see that the amount of coherence is less uh, than we started with, but you see that there's still uh, a sig significant uh, account coherence uh, left in the system. So I think that, that really is encouraging uh, for our uh, system. So to conclude, I've been mostly focusing here on, on uh, quantum dots. Uh, as uh, simultaneously, we've also been investigating uh, the ability to use this omic context to contact to superconductors. Uh, we've already seen that that we can make uh, make uh, gate tunable uh, supercritical systems with a coherence length or with, with um, supercurrents over several microns. Uh, we can see uh, discretization in the supercurrent once we go to QPCs. So I think there's really a possibility here to start investigating. The integration of all these different platforms in one. So germanium, I believe, is, is maybe the one and only platform that can truly integrate these different disciplines, uh, as it is a group four material, which is uh, perhaps a necessity for spin qubits. But the ability to make atomic contacts uh, then also allows to explore superconducting, for example, superconducting gate mounts, as an example here, uh, but also topological systems uh, by making use of the strong spin orbital thing that's present for volts. And, and I think that's a very appealing perspective uh, to use a single germanium chip to perhaps study all these different perhaps uh, platforms either individually or in a combined uh, scenario. And in the end, uh, this is still the fabrication process itself is a completely uh, compatible way with uh, advanced semiconductor manufacturing. And I think that's very encouraging uh, for quantum information processing with germanium. So with that, uh, I want to thank uh, some people in particular. Uh, he is really at the back of the picture here. Uh, that's Nico Hendricks. He was really, uh, he did an amazing PhD or is still doing an amazing PhD uh, and really was one of the um, uh, strengths behind the development of the germanium. Uh, but also others, Will Lowry, more recently Floor, uh, really had some, some very good contributions in fabrication operation. Uh, and, and really to do a good performance. 
Um, and next to that, I want to thank Giordano Scappucci. Uh, he was really pioneering the germanium. And I started by stating that uh, in the beginning, I stated to Daniel Loss that I wasn't so convinced that uh, holes would be a good platform. I think that the, the uh, demonstrations of the realizations of the heterostructure by Giordano Scappucci really made this, this happen. And in addition, I want to thank uh, Levy for um, being the um, yeah, providing his, his, his expertise as well. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention. Um, thank you. All right. Thanks, Menno. A clap on behalf of everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was, that was a really fun talk to listen to. Um, I will now open up for questions. Just if you, if you, if you want to ask a question, just mute yourself and go for it or type in the chat. And I can, um, or yeah, Menno can also see it. Very nice presentation, Menno. Congratulations on your work. Can I, can I go, JP? I don't know if you're organizing a line. Yeah, 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 go for it. Right. No, no, um, so, Menno, what do you see as the next challenge for you to scale up beyond four dots or you know, like 10 yeah. dots, 100 dots? When does it stop and what needs yeah. to be sorted out? So, um, and it, it may almost sound arrogant, but I would say um, going to eight qubits, I don't think that there's a real intrinsic problem. At least we could go to two by four. Um, if it's just about creating the qubits to demonstrate quantum coherence, um, I can foresee that we can do this. Um, what I think would, in my mind, is would be a really big push forward is to make a qubit tell with fewer IOs than numbers of qubits. So can we build a system uh, where, uh, like in classical technology, uh, at least you have uh, something like, for example, square root of gates, uh, as compared to the number of qubits that you have. Can we do that or not? And, and I think like if we, if we truly want to move away as a field from the way we work now, we should go away from the thought that let's make a line for each and every qubit, let's make an AWG for each and every qubit, maybe it's a room temperature module or so. I, I don't think that that will work. And I think that's a challenge for the entire quantum information community, uh, including transmog and so. Can we make a tell that's on chip already designed such that there are fewer IOs than the number of qubits. And, and um, this is a big challenge. I have some ideas on how to do that, um, but that's really research. Can we make it? I might have a kind of a related follow up. So, um, given the, the kind of quick progress that you've been making with these devices in germanium have you had any i mean it, it's still even it's still early days but have you had any feedback from uh like <laughs> foundry type companies like maybe intel or, or someone else in terms of uh how easy it would be to integrate into something mass produced <laughs> or, or um, so what to say to it? Um, I think so, uh, Ravi Filarizetti, he is an Intel engineer, uh, already a long time ago, uh, wrote a review. I think this is more or less the review on for germanium uh, related to classical electronics, um, uh, where he argued its compatibility. So I think it's already inside foundries. This is, uh, uh, there's not really some, some magical things that we do. Of course, there are challenges. Um, and I, they are uh, probably comparable to strain silicon. So if we were to compare the, um, um, let's say the efforts as pioneered by Andrew Zurich uh, using silicon dioxide silicon interfaces, that's by far the most compatible with advanced semiconductor manufacturing. So for example, if you have a strained heterostructure, you may already be worried that, that the, um, on the sides, um, um, such a large piece of silicon may peel off and so forth. So there are already complications that you don't encounter in, in, in academic situations. Um, 
but these can be overcome. And I imagine them to be a bit harder in germanium because our heterostructure is a bit thicker uh, as compared to, to silicon. But otherwise, it's it's really identical to silicon. I think if we what people call a silicon qubit is often a silicon germanium heterostructure, and we're now just changing uh, yep. the constitutions of that. Yeah. Yep. Um, maybe I can say something more. I think there's also an opportunity for foundries. Um, and, and something uh, which somehow miraculously happens is, so we cannot deposit everything in situ. And so we grow our heterostructure uh, made by Giordano and then we continue. And our, we have a capping layer of silicon which will for surely oxidize in air. So we have some kind of native oxide and no one knows uh, what are the amount of traps and, and, and the states inside because it's just a native oxide. And, and I think a foundry would have the ability to circumvent this. And, and I believe that if that ability would strongly reduce again um, the noise and greatly increase the uniformity in the system. Right. Yeah. Which is already quite good. <laughs> Any more questions? I know it's a bit late for us, but Menno was nice enough to stick to, to the timeline. So you've got, got a few more minutes if anyone else wants to ask something. If nobody's gonna go, I have a second question. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is relating again to, to your answer to my first question, Menno. Uh, you, you, you showed very nicely the ability to actually make the, all the qubits matching frequency, and that's probably because you have pretty decent start shift uh, with the holes. Um, and uh, my question to you is, you know, if you had a single gate controlling all the, the quantum dots, I would imagine that with holes in germanium, you have a certain spread and G factors. And, uh, uh, and that, that could be a problem. So I guess my question is from your experience, what sort of um, variability of G factors are we looking into? And uh, if this you know, poses an issue for, for germanium holes or holes in general, I guess. Yeah, um, maybe to start off, I believe this, this is a uh, stronger concern. Let's say for even for uh, electrons in silicon moss without a nanomagnet, you already have a spread in G factor. And, and it's hard to imagine that you would have a single script line that somehow with a single frequency addresses every qubit, right? Because that would require somehow the design of you to either have an enormous power that, that you're so much power broadened that you can address all of them. Um, but that line width is for sure more than the individual qubit line width. Um, and so to go to the other extreme to kind of assume that each and every qubit has an individual and unique frequency, I don't think that's too appealing either uh, because then we would need to send too many frequencies uh, through a single line and that's probably also, uh, at least in, 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 in extreme limits, not going to work. Uh, so that would require something else. And, and, and so, yeah, I, I I would not directly know the answer, but, but something that would cross my mind, what would be appealing, is can we make uh, combinations of qubit frequencies? Let's say we have two lines coming together uh, and, and there are some, for example, drives of qubits, right? And then we have individual pairs. And can we somehow then make a configuration uh, where we can uh, address every unique qubit? Um, so I, I think maybe the underlying thought is we should start to investigate what people are doing in classical electronics, right? They do multiplexing, they do frequency multiplexing, time multiplexing. Uh, that's what we should apply uh, to our technologies as well. And I don't think that we have to reinvent uh, the wheel there, but we have to kind of take that thought and see how to implement it in our system. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Menno. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. The, the results are really, really excellent and the gate operation times are, are, are really, really extremely fast. Um, so I, 
I was wondering about the, the coherence times of the system. So um, I could imagine that the current coherence times would be make it kind of tricky to do repetitive readouts and error correction in that way. Do you, do you have any like idea of what's, what's the current thing that's limiting your, your coherence times and do you have ways to you know, improve that? Yeah, uh, maybe to start off, so our quantum coherence is something like 100 microseconds and our readout is, is a little bit less than one microsecond if we push it. Um, so we could do repeated readouts. We could, in principle, I, I think we could do feedback. I, so there's no um, a limitation on that side, uh, although it's clear that uh, if you want to go to full tolerant quantum computation, this is not good enough, right? So I, I don't think in that sense it's a limitation, but in the long run it will be. And, and so um, like I think in every platform, there's a strong desire to increase quantum coherence. Um, and there are a few factors. Uh, one is um, we're still kind of brute forcing, as in we just have a simple magnet. Um, and, but we don't really know what the optimal field angle is. And probably just by aligning by eye, already making our, a few degrees off. So I think that's something what we could investigate more. Uh, maybe an out of plane field or field, different field angle as, as um, various studies. For example, also in, in at UMSW, we've already shown uh, that, that the field angle matters a lot. So that, that's something we haven't investigated at all. And we can imagine that will strongly impact on how the anisotropic spin orbit coupling will then result in, in quantum coherence. So what limits that at the moment, I, I strongly believe this is electrical noise that couples in via spin orbit coupling. This is what we find by doing the CPMG measurements, where from the amplitude and the slope of the noise that fits with the um, uh, measurements from um, uh, charge noise experiments, as well as if we look into the field uh, amplitude dependence of P2 star, uh, that strongly suggests it's electrical noise. So how to reduce that? Uh, I think there are two ways. One would be to reduce the spin orbit coupling. At the moment, it's um, actually the spin orbit coupling is a bit too strong. Uh, so we can drive very fast, um, but typically we're just outputting something like minus 40, minus 20 dB uh, on the uh, output source. Whereas, you know, like if, if you're used to strip lines, you would go almost to plus 20 dB or so on your orbit source. So I, I think there's a big gap. And so just by reducing the spin orbit coupling, which is possible by increasing the width of the quantum well, I think we'll get a longer quantum coherence. We will need more power if we want to drive at the same speed, but that's something one could uh, optimize. The second one is, is of course, electrical noise. I mentioned the, the, the silicon cap, that's now a native oxide by, overcoming that process in fabrication, I think will further increase uh, quantum coherence. Um, and probably by then you're starting to become limited by um, the natural germanium and so purified germanium will probably then do the last bit in terms of coherence. So, so in short, I think that almost in every aspect there's way to uh, improve things. Uh, although I, I would argue it's not too bad at the moment that a quantum coherence of 100 microseconds compared to operations of five and 10 nanoseconds and readout of something like a microseconds is, is already um, you know, not, not a bad ratio at least. Thank you. All right, any last questions? If not, thanks a lot, Menno. I'll clap again on behalf of everyone. And thanks all for coming. And Menno, enjoy the rest of your day. Everyone else, enjoy the rest of your afternoons and your weekends.